A different microphone. Kayla will get us dialed in. Hope you're doing well this morning. Glad that you're here. And uh, enjoyed last week with our family conference. And Pastor Kingsbury did a great job for us. But I missed our class. And I'm glad that you're here this morning. Look forward to what God has for us today at Community Bible Baptist Church. And uh, I pray that churches all across this country, uh, as we meet today, we please the Lord and that He be honored and glorified as we meet in His house. And uh, just glad that you're here this morning. Um, went on a senior trip yesterday. We were going to just go down to Mayaka City and see uh, some stallions. And uh, it turned out to be a long day. Uh, before the day was over, we were on four different buses. And um, it was just a long day, but it was a good day. We got to know people a little bit better and um, got to tour all of our buses yesterday. <laughs> But uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. If you went on the trip, thank you for your patience yesterday. And we look forward to uh, our next trip with no issues, no problems. Next trip that we're going on is the Holy Land. If you've never been there, um, I encourage you to get signed up for that. But we look forward to that. If you're here today and you're one of our care uh, leaders, I'd ask that you just be looking for your people. Make sure that they're all in their place. If they're not in their place, let's get them a... Um, phone call and we also send a postcard if you're missing from Sunday school we're going to send you a postcard let you know we know you're missing when you're not here and uh, we're just glad that you're here this morning March 28th is our next 24 hour visitation March uh, 28th we'll meet here at 10 o'clock and we'll go out there's also that day there is a, uh, a men's prayer breakfast so uh, just uh, take note, March 28th is a busy day. I know there's also a ladies' conference. A lot of things going on on March 28th. Our picnic is going to be next uh, Saturday, uh, so make sure and be a part of that if you can. The play, the school play, is coming up on uh, this Friday. Hard to believe it's already coming up, so come out and see Brother Tyler as he plays Anne of Green Gables. That'll be great. Um, I don't want to encourage you. I've uh, been talking to our Sunday school teachers and just going over our classes and everything that God's doing, I want to encourage you to invite somebody to class, uh, not because of the content that we're going over, not because of anything except the fact that we get them into church. Um, somebody's more likely to come to a Sunday school class than they will a, a church. And you can tell them you're going to have, it's a smaller group and we meet and it's at from 10 o'clock until about 1040 and uh, we just dig into the Bible, but it's a great place for people to get connected and get to know other people. So invite somebody this week to come to our class. And then also just want to mention April 18th, the end of life seminar. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 20, verse 1. And in those days Hezekiah, sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amaz, came to him and said, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And April 18th is, uh, is not a death sentence for anybody. But it's basically just a day where we can set some things in order and make sure that everything is in place. And uh, there's some things that I'll be doing that day. We've had a baby um, since, uh, since we had our will done. So we want to make sure that if something were to happen to me and my wife, that our child goes to uh, who we want them to go to and all of those sort of things. So uh, make sure that your will is up to date, uh, your trust. Uh, we're also going to have end of life planning. It's just a great day to get some things set in order. And uh, you just come to the church. And in fact, um, for some of the will stuff, you can set up appointments later. And we'll do them here at the church. We want to make it as easy for you as possible. Don't want you to have to go find a law office or go find somebody else's address or their place of business. Uh, we'll try to get it all done here. And I think that'll be a help to you. I know it'll be a help to your family and to your church. So uh, April 18th, end of life seminar. That's going to start about 10 a.m. And only go to a 12:30. We're going to have a dinner here for you, and I uh, really hope you'll take advantage of that day. And uh, just looking forward to uh, uh, the outcome from that day. And if you would turn in your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter number one, I want to apologize for getting a late start. Our clock back there is not accurate, and that's what I was going off of. So we'll get right into our passage this morning. We need to check that, and make sure the battery's good, or Maybe it just got changed and wasn't changed to the right time. Are you enjoying time change? Anybody like this time change? I like this time change. We get a little longer days. And the kids actually sleep in a little bit, which is nice, you know. Yes, sir. 
offering. Yes, sorry guys. They're standing in the back looking at me like, are we going to stand here all day or what's going on? Our offering goes to our building. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit this morning in our regular service. But there's just so many things that uh, need to be updated and need to be refreshed. And uh, we need to remember that this is God's house. And uh, we'll go over that a little bit in a little while. But this will all go toward the building fund. And um, I appreciate anything that you can do. Mark chapter number 1. We'll start reading in verse number 40. And we're also going to read Matthew chapter number 8. So if you want to look up both of those, they'll also be on the screen. Mark chapter number 1, verse 40 through 45. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and said unto him, See thou, say nothing to any man, but go thou thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, for the testimony unto them. But he went out, and he began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Also in Matthew chapter number 8, verses 1 through 4, we see another uh, another side from Matthew as he saw the same thing that took place and he recorded it as God told him to. Matthew chapter number 8 verses 1 through 4 When he was come down from the mountain a great multitude followed him and behold there came a leopard and worshipped him saying Lord if thou wilt thou canst make me clean and Jesus put forth his hand and touched him saying I will be thou clean and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See, thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto him. I enjoy reading different accounts of the same thing that took place because we see here that Matthew um, doesn't give as much detail as as we saw in, uh, in, in Mark. Mark gives us much more detail and some things that we can look at from this passage. But we see here that two men wrote about this passage. Uh, we know that there's been several miracles and all of these miracles have taken place in about uh, a 20 to 30 mile radius. Uh, we know a lot of them took place at Capernaum and uh, Cana. And uh, so we know the area that's taken place here. Let's look at the timing. Um, notice what it says in Matthew. We get something from Matthew that Mark doesn't tell us. When he was come down from the mountain. Uh, this is right after the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We already went through Matthew chapter number 5, 6, and 7. Uh, this is the beginning of Matthew chapter number 8. Jesus had just finished that discord. He just uh, spoke to his disciples and all that were there on that mountain. And he's coming down from the mountain. And this is the time period that this leper comes up to him. And we notice from uh, Mark that this leper is beseeching him. This, this leopard is begging and he's kneeling down in front of him and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. I want you to just think about a couple of things this morning. Think about leprosy. and I didn't put any pictures on the screen on purpose. We know that leprosy is a, it's a very difficult thing to look at. It's a very difficult thing to have. And this is something that isn't as common today, but it is still um, there. Um, but we, we know this as we study leprosy and we, we, we read about it, that it was very repulsive. It's very repulsive. It's a very uh, hard to look at. It's a very difficult thing to have. And uh, it was incurable. This was not something that they would eventually get over. This is something that they would have for their entire life. And it was a very difficult thing because it was repulsive, and nobody wants to be repulsive. 
Well, I've met a few people in my life who want to be repulsive. But for the most part, we don't want to be repulsive. We want everybody to accept us. We want everybody to like us. But this was something that was repulsive. It was something that um, people did not enjoy to be around. It was something that was incurable. It was something that was contagious. Boy, nobody wanted to be around these people because there was a possibility that they could get the same disease. And uh, I don't know about you, but I go to hospitals all the time. And my favorite thing at hospitals is that little uh, dispenser. Man, you get that stuff, and I lather it down nice and thick because I'm just sure that I'm going to catch whatever's going around in the rooms next to the person that I'm visiting. And the worst is when you walk into a room and you have to put on the mask and the gown and everything, you know. You're just like, I know I'm going to die after this visit, you know. Well, that's kind of the same thing that was taking place here, man. People wanted to stay away from anybody who had leprosy because it was contagious. It was repulsive. It was incurable. It was contagious. It was a life of isolation. A life of isolation. If you had leprosy, you were taken outside of the city. And you lived outside of the city normally near a dump, near the trash. Because that's where you would find food and that's where you would find the things that you would need to get through life. It was a life of isolation. Away from everybody. And in fact, if somebody were to come near you and you had leprosy, it, it, was, it was something that you had to do. You had to yell out, unclean, unclean, so that they would not come near you and not catch what you had so we see the history of this man. This man, we don't know when he got leprosy. We don't know if he had it from birth. We're not sure of the story. But we know one thing. He has leprosy, and it's repulsive. It's incurable. It's contagious. And it's a life of isolation that he's lived. And Jesus is coming down from the mountain. He's just given the sermon on the mount. And he comes down from this mountain, and here's this leper right in front of him, begging the Lord and saying, I know that you can heal me if you will. Leprosy in the Bible is always a picture of sin. It's a picture of sin. And so as we think about this leprosy, we think about how it's repulsive, we think about how um, it's contagious, we think about the fact that um, this leprosy is something that, boy, once we compare it to sin, boy, we understand it a little bit more. We think about how our sin is repulsive to a holy God. We think about the fact that um, the sin that we do, the things that we do that displease God is as repulsive as somebody who had that leprosy. This man was not the first man in the Bible to be healed of leprosy. If you remember, there's a story of a, of a king who had leprosy and uh, how there was this little girl who was from Israel and how she told the king that he could be healed from his leprosy and he went and he was told to dip seven times in the Jordan River and uh, he doesn't want to do it but they, his men talk him into it they, they basically say uh, what do you have to lose you're going to spend your whole life with this leprosy and he goes back and he dips seven times in the Jordan River and he comes up and he's clean and his flesh is clean and um, the Lord, or he was healed there. So this isn't the first man. And we'll notice that it's not going to be the last man that's healed from lepers. We see the touch of the Lord. The Bible says that he was there and he was moved with compassion. And he touches this man. Then he tells him something after he heals him. He tells him not to tell anybody what took place, but to go show himself to the priest. Anybody have an idea of why he said don't tell anybody? Yes. So he wouldn't get swamped, right? Um, everything that Jesus has done so far, um, the Bible says that everywhere he's gone, is he's been pressed. The people have been there. Even the Sermon on the Mount, the reason that he went up on the mount was to be able to get away. Uh, when Jesus stepped onto Peter's boat and asked him to take it offshore a little bit so he could teach, is because of the people, and the people are there. So we know something about this time period 
there was a lot of illness. There was a lot of sickness. There was a lot of disease. There was a lot of demonic activity. There's all of these things that are taking place here. And Jesus, after he heals him, he's moved with compassion and he heals him. But he says, don't tell anybody. I want you to go to the priest because I want the priest to know that the Messiah is here. But don't tell anybody else. There was an obedience that was desired here. He wants him to obey his voice. But we see the disobedience that's displayed. The Bible says that he published it much. And then it says, a, bl a blaze abroad. Man, he was telling everybody that came in contact with him. I believe that he was running through the streets. And I don't know who wrote, he touched me. I probably should have looked it up. But I think he wrote the first verse of he touched me. And he was going through that city, and he was singing at the top of his mouth, He touched me. And people were like, this is the guy who had leprosy. What's going on? And um, the disobedience is displayed. And I think it's interesting that Mark talks about the fact that Jesus said not to tell anybody. And they both say Jesus said not to tell anybody. But Mark goes on to tell us that he didn't just not tell anybody. He told everybody that he could. The consequences of the miracle. The Bible tells us right there in Mark. But he went and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter the city, but was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. It gets to the point where there's a consequence of the miracle that he did. He can't even go into the city anymore. He can't go into Capernaum. He can't go into Canaan of Galilee because the people would recognize him and the people would come and they would press upon him. And um, the consequence for this miracle and the consequence of the disobedience uh, that this man displayed is that Jesus can no longer effectively do what he came to do. He's already mentioned that he did not come to heal, but he came to preach. He came to speak. He came to uh, talk about the kingdom of heaven. He came to do the things that he just did on the mountaintop, and he gets down off of this mountain, and here's this leper. Well, I'm going to give you some things this morning, just some applications that we can take from this miracle. Just four or five verses here from uh, both of these men who wrote down their description of it. But the first thing that I wrote down, applications for us in 2015, these stories are in the Bible for a reason. Number one, we ought to have faith that Jesus can. We ought to have faith that Jesus can. If you notice here that when this leper came, he said, I know that you can heal me if you will. He had faith that Jesus had the power to heal him. I'm sure that he had heard about the water turning into blood. He had heard about the demonic spirit that was uh, removed in the synagogue. He had heard what Jesus could do. And he comes to Jesus, and here's this man who's repulsive. Here's this man who's living in isolation. Here's this man that has to yell out unclean every time that somebody comes near him. And he says, I know that you can heal, heal me, if you will. We ought to have the faith that Jesus can because he can do anything. The Bible says that there are no limitations to his power, that he is all powerful. And whatever the situation is in your life, we need to have the faith that this leper had that Jesus can. He can take care of the difficult situations and he can take care of the things that are in our life. If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Remember what we've already discussed. We've discussed the fact that leprosy was incurable. There was no cure. The doctors of that day, Matthew knew that there was nothing that could be done for this person. He knew that just like, just like cancer and just like some of these other things, there's no 100% cure. There's nothing that can, can be done that's going to just dramatically change this person's life and help them. We ought to have the faith that Jesus... Can. We need to have the faith that he can still save. And he still saves. 
He's still in the saving business, and he wants to save those people that are in your life, those people that are living riotously, those people that are raising Cain, like Pastor Kingsbury talked about. He still saves. He still restores. Man, it was just good to have, uh, it was good to have the founder of RU here because uh, the stories of people who were just gone, everybody else would write them off. Everybody else would say there's no hope for them. They're just too far into that addiction. They're too far down that road that they cannot come back. But we need to have the faith that the people that we love, the people that are living riotously, the people that are raising Cain, the people that aren't where they're supposed to be, can be restored. All of us can think of somebody who's not where they're supposed to be. Now, truthfully, all of us have work to do. All of us are not where we'd like to be. All of us need to draw closer to the Lord. But we can think about people who are in addiction. We can think about people who are in alternate lifestyles. We can think about people who have just made some wrong choice and have put them in a bad place. We need to have the faith that Jesus can restore them. Man, we need to pray and ask the Lord to restore them to relationship with Him. We need to have the faith that Jesus can heal. Here's, this, here's Matthew. Matthew's the physician on the team. He's the doctor, and he's watching all this take place, and I'm thinking, he's like, there's no cure for that. There's nothing that can be done for this leper. But this leper comes and says, oh, there's one thing that can be done, and I know thou canst make me clean. We need to have faith that he can heal. We need to have faith that he can provide. Man, this is a tough one. We need to have faith that he can provide. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. And we need to have faith that he will provide just in time. This past Thursday, I text preacher and I said, we need to bring over some money. We've got some bills that need to be paid. And uh, uh, we definitely need to bring over some money to make this payment happen. And he said, not right now. And I was thinking to myself a little bit. I was like, no, we need to do this in order to get this paid. And uh, all week long, the Lord had been uh, uh, touching my heart to go see a certain couple. They haven't been here in a while. They're not able to be here. And so uh, I just said, okay, you're the pastor, and uh, we won't transfer that, that money over right now. And uh, so we went to see, I went to see this couple and had a great time with them. Anytime you show up and they're getting cantaloupe out, that's a good time. And uh, we had cantaloupe together. And uh, I'm on a diet right now, and they said, do you want cantaloupe? And I was like, wow, that's the first time anyone in 11 years has ever asked me for cantaloupe. Normally when I go on a diet and I'm trying to lose weight, they come in, hey, would you like some lard? You know, <laughs> would you like some pie? Would you like some cookies? They said, would you like some cantaloupe? And I was like, no way, that's awesome. So we had cantaloupe together and just had a great time, and they're doing really well. And uh, getting up to leave, I'm already encouraged. And they said, hey, before you go, I want to give you something. And they went to the back room and they came back out and they said, we haven't been able to be in service, but here's our tithe. It was double what I wanted to transfer over. Double. We need to have faith that Jesus can. That he can save, that he can restore, that he can heal, that he can provide. You know, oftentimes we put more faith in chairs than we do the Lord. None of us thought about it when we sat down this morning. None of us thought about, boy, I wonder if this chair is going to hold me up this time. No, we just sat down. Because we know that this chair is going to hold us up. How do we know that? Because it held us last week. How many of you are in the same chair as last week? Anybody? We knew it was going to hold us up because we've sat in that chair before and it's a good chair and it was made well. We need to have faith in an all-powerful, all-knowing God. Do you understand that God knows your circumstance? He knows where you're at and He knows exactly what you need and He will provide it. We need to have faith that the Lord is going to save, that He's going to restore, that He's going to heal, and that He's going to provide. second thing I wrote down, application. Jesus loves us. 
Man, that's simple. We've known that for years, and we sing that song, Jesus Loves Me, probably the first song that we've ever heard. But boy, as I read this story, I see it come out, and it comes alive, and as I read it this week and I began to pour over it, man, this just came off the page to me. Jesus has just got through saying, I'm not here to heal. This is not why I'm here. This is not why I've come. And he said, we need to go to the synagogues, and we need to go to many cities, and we need to begin to preach and tell the story of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, this is not why he's come. But he comes off the mountain, and here's this leper. This leper that he came for. This leper that he's going to die for. This leper that he created. He knew the name of this leper before this leper was born. He knew the name of this leper before the foundations of the world were created. And this leper comes to him, and this leper is repulsive, and this leper has been isolated, and this leper is contagious, and this leper has lived a difficult life, and this leper comes before him, begins to beseech him, and begins to beg him, and says, I have the faith to say this, I know thou canst make me clean, if thou wilt. The compassion of Jesus in this story is amazing because he's just got through saying, and now in, our, in Mark, he just gets through saying, I'm not here to heal. That's not why I've come. But here's this person that he loves, this person that he created, this person that everybody else has left. Everybody else is pushed to the border of the city. Everybody else is left in isolation. And Jesus is moved with compassion. You know, if this was us, what would our response have been? Well, it happens quite a bit. Maybe it doesn't happen to you, but I'll be out and about, and somebody will come up to me. Now, they don't have leprosy, but they have issues. Boy, you can see the issues. You can smell the issues. You know that this person is living in isolation, this person is repulsive, and they come up to us, boy, what's our response? If we're to become more like Jesus, I believe that we've got to be moved with compassion. You cannot have compassion on someone and not do something, and not move. There's movement that comes with compassion. And uh, we see this here, that Jesus, he touches him, but then he says, I will. Jesus loves us this morning. He loves us so much that he left heaven, and the reason that he did come was to die for us. But he died for that sinner, that, that leper. He died for him just as much as anybody else. And that person that comes up to you, he died for them. And I think as Christians, we ought to be moved with compassion. We ought to not look at where people are, but think about God can restore this person. God can save this person. God can heal this person. And God can provide for this person. And we need to remember that everybody that's on this earth, Jesus loves. Somebody that everybody else had forgotten, everybody else had isolated from, and everybody else was repulsed at. Jesus healed them. Now I love this, and maybe I won't be able to I won't be able to get it across the way I'd like to. But I wrote this down. Jesus knows what we need. He knows what we need. I want you to notice something back in our text. Mark chapter number one. We'll start at verse number forty one. And Jesus moved with compassion put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him I will be thou clean and as soon as he had spoken immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed I want you to notice something there that it says that Jesus put forth his hand and touched him and nothing happened Notice what it says in our text. Jesus reaches forth his hand, he's moved with compassion, puts forth his hand and touches him, 
and saith unto him, I will be clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was clean. Let me ask you a question this morning. Why did Jesus touch him? You think back to the water and wine, there was no touch there. There was no feeling of the water to turn it into wine. You think back to the nobleman's son. He was 20 miles away from the nobleman's son. He never touched the nobleman's son. You think about the unclean spirit. He commanded the unclean spirit. He never touched the person who had that unclean spirit. You think about the fish and the, the draw to fishes. There was no touching of the water to make that happen. But here in our text, we see that Jesus touches him. Well, why is that important? Because he was repulsive. Because he was contagious. Because everywhere he went, if anyone even got near him, he had to yell out, unclean. And boy, as soon as he would say that, you know what they would do? They would get away. Because he lived in isolation. I want you to notice that the, the miracle did not take place until Jesus spoke, I will be thou clean. But I believe with all my heart that the reason that Jesus touched him was because that's what he needed. Can you imagine your whole life having people repulsed at your very presence. Putting you in isolation because of your condition. A condition that maybe you had no control over getting. Jesus reaches out and touches him because that's exactly what he needed. Well, it didn't have as much to do as the leprosy as the rejection. The rejection that he faced all of his life, the isolation that he faced all of his life, boy, you get to a point where you just desperately need a friend. You desperately need somebody that you can talk to, somebody who's not repulsed by you. And Jesus knows exactly what we need, and he doesn't just heal this man, but he reaches out, and touches him and the touch had nothing to do with the miracle it had everything to do with what that man needed and can I tell you in 2015 God is still very in touch with what you need he knows exactly what you need in the difficult situations that you're in in the struggles that you're in in the work situation in the home situation in the family situation and that person who's just uh, being unjust toward you, he knows exactly what we need, and he gives it to us at the exact time we need. Jesus knows what we need. He touches him, but then he speaks. And it wasn't until he spoke that he became clean. Another thing I wrote down is obedience is still desired. We kind of had the exact opposite command that this man had. Jesus heals this man, and then he says, I command you not to tell anyone. You know what Jesus commands us? Tell everyone. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's exactly what this man did. Boy, if you read the passage, he published it much and blazed a broad the matter. Boy, anybody he came in touch with, he wanted to tell them what Jesus did for him. How Jesus changed his life. How Jesus took him from a time of isolation and rejection and repulsiveness to making him whole again. Obedience is still desired. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. But unfortunately, and I just, I misspelled this word, disobedience displayed. Unfortunately, in 2015, we still have disobedience displayed. We're commanded to tell everybody. Boy, everybody at your work ought to know that there's a God in heaven who loves them, who died for them, 
who can, they can spend eternity in heaven instead of a place called hell because we've been told to tell everybody. We're to publish it much and we're to blaze it abroad. Remember that sin and leprosy are a picture of one another. The isolation that people face in their sin is separation from God. And they're outcast from the city called a place called heaven. And unless we get to the point where we obey and we publish much and blaze it abroad, there are people at our workplace, in our neighborhood, in our church, who will die, and they'll be isolated from that place called heaven, separated from God because of their sin. Jesus said this, he's not willing that any should perish. Just like that leper came and he said, I will, be thou clean. That's what he wants to do for your co-worker, your neighbor, your son, your daughter, that person that you're thinking of. They're just so far gone. We need to have faith that Jesus can, that he can heal them, that he can restore them, that he can save them, that he can provide for them, and that they can grow and have a relationship with him. not a long story in the Bible but there's a lot that we can get from it Jesus knows exactly what you need this morning and he can provide it we need to have faith in him but then we need to obey him and publish it much and blaze abroad what Jesus did for us how he cleansed us from all unrighteousness so that we could spend eternity in heaven with him Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank for each one that's here. Father, I pray that this week we'll get serious about obeying your command to go into all the world. Father, I'm so thankful that you give us exactly what we need when we need it. Father, we're thankful for your word and the things that we can draw from it. But Father, help us not to just draw from it. Father, help us to use it this week, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you are dismissed. Church will start in about 15 minutes. Thank you for being here. Invite somebody to come to class next week. For what? Oh, really? Still no cure. Isn't that something?
silent while the world raised its voice in loud and angry tones they took the
Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome this morning to community. So glad that you're here with us. Looking forward to a great day of worship this morning. Why don't you join me in standing, and let's begin the service this morning by singing to God be the glory, great things he has done, and truly he is great. Sing with me on the first. We'll sing all three verses there of to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. To yield his life and atone for sin. How many of you this morning would say God has done something at one time or another that was great in my life? Raise your hand. How many of you could say there's a time in my life where I asked Christ to forgive me of my sins and take me to heaven when I die? And I know he did that. Raise your hand. And that's worth singing about. So when we sing this next verse, think about that. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Sing on the second now. 